Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Humanities Centre for the second session in our multidisciplinary investigation into the meaning and nature of the ocean. As we've structured this series, uh, this session and the next will be focused on the appeal, or as we've called it, the allure of the ocean for people working in a range of fields. So uh, today it'll be our great pleasure to hear from three scientists whose research in differing ways is focused on the ocean. Um, it is, uh, I want to say, an especial pleasure to hear from those working in the natural sciences. Now, we are, of course, uh, a humanities centre, but it's our belief here that the best way of understanding the human condition is by bringing together voices from a great array of disciplines. Um, this is vital if we are to contemplate and appreciate this world in which we've all been thrown, as Heidegger put it. Thus, I'm delighted to introduce our three contributors today, all highly respected members of USD's fact, um, College of Arts and Sciences. I'll be doing these introductions in purely alphabetical order. Um, that's not going to be the order in which they speak, which is a little confusing, but there we are. <laughs> At the far end, uh, Dr. Sue Lowry. Uh, Dr. Lowry is professor and chair in the Department of Biology. She received her PhD in marine biology from UCSD's Scripps Institute of Oceanography. And she's been a recipient of the National Science Foundation pre-doctoral fellowship and a National Research Council post-doctoral fellowship. Dr. Lowry's particular research interests lie in the effects of endurance swimming on the development of muscle in juvenile marine fishes. Next along the row, Dr. Jennifer Prairie is Associate Professor in the Department of Environmental and Ocean Sciences, joining USD in 2014. Like Dr. Lowry, she received her PhD from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography, and her research focuses upon biological, physical interactions in marine ecosystems, particularly focusing on plankton. Dr. Prairie's current project includes studying marine snow formation in turbulence and zooplankton foraging in patchy environments. Which is the most beautiful sentence I've, I've <laughs> uttered for a long time. It's absolutely gorgeous. So I'm hoping we can hear something about that foraging. <laughs> Um, our, th our third panelist today is Dr. Natalie Raines, who is Chair and Professor in the Department of Environmental and Ocean Sciences. She received her PhD in Marine Sciences from North Carolina State University. Dr. Raines' research is centered on the dispersal and population dynamics of marine organisms and the implications of these processes for fisheries management and marine conservation. She also has interests in advancing marine science education and, good news for us all today, improving ocean literacy. Lovely to have you all with us today. Please give a big welcome to Sue Larry, Jenny Prairie, and Natalie Ray. Thank you, Brian. So Brian asked us to start by speaking a little bit about how we got into our respective fields. And so, I had to think about this a little bit because when we think about the allure of the ocean, I think that's not something that we as scientists think so much about. And as I was thinking about it, uh, to me, it, it kind of broke down into some different categories. And it first started as a discovery, mostly when I was in high school, um, that led me to a deeper discovery of the ocean. And that connected to science which um, I really fell in love with after taking a biology class in eighth grade and also eventually led to adventure and travel. And so when I talk about this, I'm gonna talk about some of my life experiences and it's in somewhat of a linear way, but you should understand that the connections between all of these things, so the discovery and the science and the adventure and travel continues today and it's definitely not linear and each of the categories feed into themselves. So here we go. Uh, 
How did this all start? Well, um, I should preface this by saying that I come from a family of non-water people. Um, no one in my family really likes the water. In fact, my brother um, perfected the doggy paddle when he was little because he hated getting his face wet. Um, he even won a summer camp race doing the doggy paddle. <laughs> and meanwhile, I was the kid that my parents were always dragging out of the water. And so I think for one, I had that love of the water that started really early on. I'm not sure where it came from. Um, the second part is that my family, we did a lot of family vacations, but we were not the go sit at the beach and relax kind of people. My, they were all about, let's go see national parks, let's go walk, spend time in nature. And so I definitely learned to love nature and appreciate being outside from them, despite all the times that we got lost canoeing and hiking because my father is a terrible navigator. Um, so um, all that aside, this kind of all started in terms of the marine science when I was 15 and my parents preemptively sat me down and said, what are you going to do this summer? And of course, as a surly 15 year old, I was like, I don't know. And they said, you are definitely not sitting around the house doing nothing. You better find something to do. And I happened to be leafing through my mom's Sunset Magazine and at the back were ads for Sea Camp. And I kind of looked at it and said, well, what about this? And so several months later, I found myself on Catalina um, at Sea Camp. And I should also say that I was really naive and I signed myself up for a scuba certification class. I had never been snorkeling before. And usually you start off with snorkeling, decide if you like being in the water, and then you move on to getting scuba certified. But no, I just, everything was sort of backwards. I had an introduction to, to snorkeling class that came after my cert, scuba certification class. So it was really, really mixed up. Um, nonetheless, I got scuba certified and I ended up going back to this camp for a couple of years in a row. And um, I decided I wanted to do research. I don't know why, but I did because I was that geeky 16 year old now, I guess. And I had seen a lot of these wavy turbine snails um, in the shallow water. And I convinced my instructor to let me do a research project. And so I said, well, why don't we just look at snail movement? Um, and he said, okay. And uh, we decided, he helped me brainstorm and decided that we should mark the snail. So this is a pretty common marine science technique where you collect an organism, mark them in some way, release them, go back and try to find them again and, and see how far they've moved from that original place where you've marked them. And we did it by taking the snails putting them upside down and they have this beautiful white area here. And I thought, oh, I can just take a pencil and write numbers on them and go back and find them. Well, it turns out that this stays nice and white and smooth right here because the snails, when they pull out their muscular foot and move around, it rubs on the snail right here. <laughs> so um, a week later, when I went back to look for my tagged snails, of course, I, all I found were just, if I was lucky, blurred pencil marks on the bottom of snails. And, to this day, I still know nothing about how snails move or how far they go. Um, but what it did is it got me thinking about research and thinking that this was definitely where I wanted to go and continue. So um, in college, I worked as a dive master and the dive shop that I worked for had a boat that they kept in Mexico. And so it meant that Every other weekend, I was traveling to Mexico to the Sonoran side of, of the Gulf of California and hopping on a boat and teaching diving classes. And this is really the first experience where um, I saw human impacts in action. And this was a really eye-opening experience for me. So this is a, a picture of a Mexican boat that was actually a research educational boat. Um, and if you look really carefully at the top where I've circled it in red, those are actually shark fins that are hanging and drying. And um, they supposedly were doing this for education and research, but they were actually shipping all those shark fins to Japan. And when we went to some of the small islands around where we were, you would find these big carcass piles of sharks. Um, so for context, this is a friend of mine who's 6'5". He's a really big guy. And I know he's bent over, but these were pretty big mounds of shark carcasses. And you can see this is a hammerhead um, shark head. 
And unfortunately, a lot of the sharks were really small. So this, this shark here, there's no scale for context, but it was about the size of my palm. So really small sharks being fished. Um, most of them were just carcasses without fins. And that started getting me thinking about this. At the time, people weren't talking a lot about shark finning. Now, most of you have probably heard about this, but I won't tell you how many years ago this was. And this wasn't something that was widely talked about. It was pre-internet. Um, <laughs> so I knew I wanted to continue in this field. And as um, an undergraduate, I had the opportunity to go to the Shannon Point Marine Center, which is in Anacortes, Washington, up in the San Juan Islands. I had an REU position, um, which stands for Research Experience for Undergraduates. USD has some REU um, programs. They're great for, for exposing students to research. And there I actually did my first official research project. So I looked at the UV effects on this transparent tunicate. So tunicates are also called sea squirts or ascidians, and they don't look like much. I get that. They look like little blobs. They, these in particular are probably only about this big. They live on the sides of docks or attached to rocks or something hard. And they're, this particular species was transparent. And so I was interested, this was during the time of the ozone hole and lots of interest in UV. So I was interested in seeing how UV affected their their populations. And part of this job was, or my job, was to look at um, the, all the stages of this tunicate. So these tunicates, like most marine invertebrates and fishes, release larvae, or the baby stages, and those larvae disperse in the water, spend a certain amount of time in the water before um, moving and finding a suitable adult habitat landing on that habitat and then starting the adult stage. And it was when I got exposed to these larvae that I feel like I found my calling. Um, so this is an example of a tunicate larva. They're called tadpole larvae because they look like a tadpole. And it was amazing to me to see these for the first time moving around in a little dish. They're very small. They're uh, microns in size. And if you think about that, this is a larval stage that is swimming in the ocean, a big, vast body of water. And this is what is connecting distant populations. It's that dispersal of that larval stage. So to me, that was fascinating. These guys are really cool in particular because they actually have a notochord and, and dorsal nerve cord as larvae. So they have vertebrate characteristics that they lose once they settle and metamorphose to the adult stage. But you can think of these as, as distant cousins to us, um, your, your blobby relatives right here. Um, so after this, I knew I wanted to work with larvae and that's what I spent my graduate time doing, looking at larval stages. What captivated me about larvae, I think can be summarized into two components. So the first is just how diverse larval forms are. Remember that these are microscopic, these are organisms that are very, very tiny. You need to, to collect them and look at them look at, under a microscope. And there's just such diversity in the forms. So there's an Echinopluteus larva, there's a Bicanaria larva. Any ideas as to what these will grow into as, as adults? Any guesses? Oh, nope. <laughs> like, yeah, I know it's a guess, right? <laughs> Oh, nice. Yeah, that's very good. So yes, the Echinopluteus will grow into sea urchin larvae. The larvae will grow into sea urchins and the Bipinaria become sea stars. And what's amazing is that these two members are part of the same phylogenetic group. They're all, both of them are echinoderms and their larvae are so different in, in, in shape and form and function. So that to me was just amazing. And some other forms. So this is what we call anoplii. They're pretty different. You can see they have appendages. They swim better than the, the echinoderm larvae I just showed you. Why do you think they're green in the center? Any thoughts on that? Yes. Good, good. Yeah, so they don't actually make it themselves, but they feed on the phytoplankton or the photosynthetic microorganisms that live in the water. And so you're seeing their gut right there. 
So yeah. And so they swim around, they will eventually metamorphose into the cyprid stage. The cyprids are really interesting because they don't feed, but they have all these circles right here. Those are oil globules that they use for energy reserves. And you can see they have this really nice swimming appendage. And those cyprids, well, their, their whole role is to get back to the adult habitat. So they will eventually find a suitable habitat, land on their head, secrete some glue, and metamorphose. Any ideas on what they will turn into? Oh, oh yeah, barnacles. So common in, in tide pools, if you've ever been tide pooling or on the bottoms of ships. And then my last example, these are zoea. Um, these are my favorites. <laughs> They are very spiny, big eyes, a, a small little tail, but they have a post-larval stage where they start to change and you might start to see what kinds of shapes they have. They have these little claws and then actually metamorphose again into a small juvenile. And so you can see that's a little crab. And this guy is probably a millimeter in width across the carapace. Um, even at this stage, they're really, really mean. If you put your finger in a dish, they will try to, to pinch you. <laughs> and so it's amazing how those behaviors start very, very young. Um, and this is what these guys will eventually turn into. So these are blue crabs, which is what I did my dissertation research on. So if you've been on the East Coast and eaten crab, you've probably eaten blue crab because they're very commercially important. So um, that's the first part, larval diversity. The second part that's drawn me or captured my attention has um, this idea that larval behavior matters. So the larvae live in the plankton and to some degree calling them planktonic is a misnomer because they're microscopic and they're in the water. We think of them as plankton. However, the word plankton comes from planktos, a Greek word that means to wander or drift. And most of these larvae are not just at the mercy of the currents, they're not just drifting. So what's amazing is that they can actually behave so they can respond to environmental conditions like changes in salinity or temperature or food, lots of different types of cues. And they can behave and move. They can't swim horizontally against the currents because the currents are quite strong or can be quite strong. But what they can do is position themselves in the water column so that they can take advantages of currents that are moving in different directions. And we see this with cyprid larvae, which are the barnacle larvae. They move down deep and those currents are often going towards shore. And that's where they need to go to finish their life cycle. So this idea that these really small microscopic things are actually in control of where they go is amazing to me. And this is what I study. So I look at larval behavior, we go measure larvae in the water. We look at the physical oceanography, connect how the oceanographic conditions help or hinder the larval dispersal. But essentially I'm trying to figure out how larvae get from point A to point B. And most of that work happens here now um, off the coast of La Jolla. We've been mostly focusing on barnacles recently. And because I also look at the adult barnacles. It means that we have to go to the rocky intertidal habitats when they're exposed. And that only happens at low tide. And sometimes that does happen at night. Mm -hmm. And so the reason I show these photos is because so much of what we do um, is not planned. And so there have been many a night when I've gone out and oftentimes I get to see these beautiful moon rises or moon sets. And so you're not necessarily expecting that, but when you take a moment and actually look around you and think, wow, it's actually quite beautiful out here, even though it's an ungodly hour. Um, this is another example of, we were sampling for larvae. When we sample, it's really loud. We have a generator in the boat, we're really busy. And I heard a funny sound and looked up and a whale had just surfaced. And then it was a little juvenile whale, gray whale, and it just swam right by. Um, this is Mission Beach, so it's, we're looking south here. That looks familiar. So just happy accidents that make you realize kind of how amazing this area is. Um, it also tells you that even though I love the small things, and that's what I study, it's hard not to be captivated by the large um, marine fauna that come by as well. 
And I've been really fortunate to travel and to see some of these larger things, um, whether it be gray whales in Mexico. Um, we were really fortunate to swim with spinner dolphins in Hawaii. This happened completely by accident. Um, we dragged our kids who were pretty little at the time down a really long hike. And they, of course they complained the whole time. And we got to this area to snorkel and it was just filled with this tourist boat. So there were probably a hundred people learning how to snorkel with these big noodles and flailing around. And every, we just looked at the water and thought, oh no. <laughs> and we just sat, had our lunch and let the tourists go away. And a half an hour later, it was just us. And we went snorkeling and this pot of spinner dolphins just started swimming around us. Um, and it was amazing. We were the only ones there. So just happy accidents. Um, we've had the chance to go see the whale sharks in the Sea of Cortez. Um, they swim really fast, one little flick of their dorsal fin, and I could not keep up with that shark. And that's probably a 25 foot juvenile shark. Um, manta rays in Australia and reef sharks in Belize. And I think for me, part of the allure is also that now I get to share all of this with my kids who are teenagers. And so I think so many facets of the ocean permeate both my professional and personal life. And it's, it's nice to have that meshing together. And that's all I have to say about the allure. And I think Sue Lowry is now gonna speak for the speaker. Thank you. Um, so um, like many people, and including Natalie, um, the ocean has this allure. And when you look out at it, um, it, it seems vast and endless, which can be either frightening or uh, captivating and um, hopeful, uh, or both at the same time. And it also speaks to not only me, but many other people across um, time, is it opportunity. And um, I happened to find myself um, growing up in the 70s in a small town in Mississippi. Um, and as a teenager becoming an, in a budding science nerd, also finding myself um, out of context with my surroundings, a feminist, and um, also somebody who was really looking for adventure. And so I got really interested in the ocean. And when I went to college, also it was a first generation college person. So um, this seemed very um, different to my family. And so when I was in, in college, I would do summer school at an ocean station at Ocean Springs, Mississippi. And so it was one of the most exciting things that I did um, in college. And so uh, two summers, I went down there. One summer, I focused on animals. The next summer, I went down and did marine plants. And um, one of the most, I think, probably telling experiences we would go out on a small uh, converted ship that had been, well, not ships, probably too generous for that, a small shrimp trawler that um, was, uh, we would trawl up a lot of organisms, take them back, and that's what we studied for the week. So whatever we found, that's what we learned. And it was really great. And so a squall came up during one of these events, and I found myself alone on the deck. All of the other students had um, rushed into the cabin and uh, the TA and I were standing there covered in mud because we'd been sorting through this straw, um, fish slime, all kinds of other things, uh, drenched completely to the bone. And we looked at each other and she said to me, boy, wouldn't our mothers really think we were a mess? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I knew that's exactly where I needed to be. So um, the allure of the ocean, not only that endless possibility, but it had that little bit of uh, rebellion that was just enough. And also, as you'll see scientifically, extremely interesting. So very much like what Natalie was talking about, um, science is at the center. Um, I'm not really a person who sails or does a lot of recreation in the ocean. Every time I'm there, I'm pretty much there learning, even if I'm not there for that purpose. And it's really bound up with the science but it's also an opportunity for adventure and new horizons and new uh, experiences. And then um, I can share and teach about those now in my life now. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about what um, a great aspect of the ocean is that it's quite an extreme environment in many cases. So you've got areas where you have one extreme of temperature like in Antarctica, 
I'll show you a picture later where you have exactly the opposite extreme, where you have um, these rifts, where you have underwater volcanoes with fantastic um, ecosystems. And then you also have the aspect of the depths of the ocean. So the deep part of the ocean is something that figured rather large in my um, graduate school. And I worked in a lab. Oh, well, before I get to that, uh, I'll talk a little bit about this deep oceans. Uh, the deep ocean is probably the most common habitat on Earth, and we know very little about it. So I thought it would be interesting to go back in time and say in the 60s, so this time when I was getting really interested in science, uh, obviously the space program was very public. It was on TV all the time. Everybody knew about it, but nobody knew that much about deep sea research. In fact, there were very few people that were doing it, and we didn't know a lot about it. So between 69 and 72, 24 people visited the moon, 24 men, 12 of whom walked on the surface of the moon. And that was an incredible scientific achievement. The deepest spot in the ocean, the Marianas Trench, 10,000 meters, two men visited in 1960, Walsh and Picard, and uh, not another person went to the Marianas Trench until 2012. Now, as, as of the summer, there have been 27 different people who have gone to the Marianas Trench. And there's really been an uptick in visits since 2019. And we can see that there's been an incredible diversity. So there have been five women. So there's a lot of other um, people out there who were um, eager to do something that uh, hadn't been done before. And, and I just put in a couple of the first. The first um, former astronaut was also the first woman to go to the uh, Marianas Trench, first Micronesian. And then this summer, the first Black woman to go to the Marianas Trench. So we see that people are learning more about the deep ocean. And I think it's really been stimulated by a lot of the technology that's available today so that we can access it remotely with um, all kinds of different um, cameras and things like that. When I went to graduate school, and I didn't go immediately, I worked as a technician in um, medical research for a while, learned a lot of great techniques and, and skills that I applied when I got there to marine biology. But when I decided to go to graduate school, I really wanted it to be in marine biology. So I uh, came to the Scripps Institution of Oceanography and after a circuitous path, ended up in the SOMRO lab, which was affectionately known as the high pressure zone uh, for many reasons. And one of them though, was that this has been a lab that had studied extreme environments. So it varied between, um, at, the, at the moment that I was there, they were um, elucidating the pathways and the biochemistry of the symbiosis between sulfide oxidizing bacteria and then all of these uh, fantastical creatures that had been recently discovered at the hydrothermal vents. So here we were, an entire ecosystem um, directly disconnected from the sun for food sources and never seen before or even anticipated. And they found it and then they found that they were everywhere all over the globe. So they were working on that. Uh, deep sea has a lot of different challenges besides the temperature, if you're close to that. Normally it's very cold, but it also has a lot of pressure. So just to illustrate, if you're thinking about how pressure affects air-filled spaces, that's easy to understand. So imagine a styrofoam cup. I know people aren't familiar with these so much anymore, but they're, <laughs> they have air-filled spaces, which makes them great insulators. But since they have air-filled spaces, if you put them under pressure, they'll collapse. So if you were to take this cup, and let's imagine that this is the cup on Mount Everest, and then this would be the cup at sea level. If you were to take this cup, for instance, like we do on our field trips, down to maybe 400 meters, you would find that the air spaces would compress, and you might have something much smaller. And then if you took it to the bottom of the Santa Catalina Basin, which is about 1,200 meters, then you would find that the spaces would be even smaller. Okay, so you get compression of air-filled spaces. If any of you have ever gone to a fish market where you have reef fish or rock fish, you might notice that when you reverse the process, that the air-filled spaces expand. And so the rock fish that are pulled up, even from a modest depth, will have um, an expansion of air-filled spaces like their swim bladder, and they'll actually push their stomachs right out of their mouth. So you don't see a lot of deep sea fish doing a lot of vertical migrations at that level. But one of the things that you don't think about 
is if an airfield space is affected, what about something like an enzyme? And it actually turns out that enzymes can be inhibited by high pressure. And then depolymerization of DNA, for instance, can be accelerated by high pressure. So that lab was really studying how did organisms exist under these extreme conditions, either different pressures or different temperatures. Well, I was interested in a different aspect of how organisms down there um, withstood these conditions, because the other thing is that they don't have a food source. All of the food is drifting, unless you're at the hydrothermal vents, all of this food is drifting down from the surface waters, as Jenny's going to talk about later. And so these fish may have episodic access to food. And so I was really interested in how that affected their growth and whether they would have episodic growth or whether they would most of the time be sort of quiescent and nothing much would be happening. So I went out on the continental shelf. We dredged a lot of fish up. I would bring them back in the laboratory and do some studies. And then later on, I applied some of the similar sort of uh, examination of metabolic enzymes with uh, plankton, with mesozooplankton in an iceberg cruise. And so I got to go with uh, Rod Kaufman and other scientists, and we were looking at the effect of melting icebergs on the ecosystems around them. And you can see that I'm um, measuring an Antarctic krill there. Well, there's limits to what you can learn when you are collecting something at a distance and then bringing it back to the laboratory in a freezer. <laughs> so um, to answer some of the questions that I wanted to ask, I wanted to have conditions that were a little bit more like the ocean. So I would uh, simulate some of the things that I was interested in in these extreme environments by gathering uh, organisms from local environments, say juvenile fish from Mission Bay. And so I worked on that when I was in uh, grad school. And then now um, my students and I have most recently been looking at the effects of swimming on fish uh, muscle growth and the metabolism there. And so we've been uh, teamed up with the Hubs Research Institute Aquarium uh, or aquaculture facilities. And in the case on the left there, we're sorting fish to get started with a really large experiment that we did where we took juvenile um, white sea bass, which they raised to be released into the wild. And we put them into raceways to see how um, exercising them would affect their growth. And then on the right, you can see um, um, a, an apparatus that was built at the Southwest Fisheries Science Center in which we have much more powerful pumps and we can get speeds that actually will um, make yellowtail juveniles work hard. So you have to get the water up to about a meter per second in order to really make them swim hard. And so we had this much more uh, large organization there. Now, normally if you're raising fish, in um, either a laboratory or an aquaculture facility or even at your house, you have a fairly confined space and you have a pretty low velocity so that you're maybe just keeping the water moving just enough to keep it oxygenated and keeping the water clean. And uh, the fish aren't really working that hard. So um, in order to make them work hard, we basically created these um, treadmills, water treadmills. And so when we were figuring out how fast do we need to make them swim, we would do something very similar to a stress test. So if you've ever had one of these at the physicians, you can sort of maybe think to this. So what you do is you raise the speed incrementally and maybe in a doctor's office, they might have to change the incline to make you work harder. And you keep doing that until the person, or in this case, the fish, can't exercise anymore. And that's their aerobic limit. So we determined this for the different fish species and then we set our raceways to 70% of that maximum aerobic speed. Now, they swam not for an hour that we might take to reach our limit. They swam 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for four weeks in our experiments. And you might think, wow, if you're doing that much swimming, all of your energy is gonna be redirected to swimming and you're not gonna have any leftover for growth. That was not the case. In almost every case, we saw that the racing uh, going, being reared under the high swimming velocity increased their growth rate, particularly in the yellowtail. And that not only that, is that we were able to take what we could sort of considered a generalist fish, like the white sea bass. So think of a weekend warrior, somebody who might do a 5K for charity every once in a while. Um, and uh, so they're fit, but not, you know, not, they're not exercising every day. We could turn them into what the yellowtail would be, 
an ultra marathoner or an Olympian. So we would see not only did their stress level go down, their insulin-like growth factor went up, which is a stimulant to muscle growth. And we would see that these fish were morphing into the physiology and metabolism that was very much like the yellowtail. So simulating the ocean was even good for the fish. So working with students has been one of the greatest aspects of being a marine biologist and working at USD. And then um, I now get to share this love of the ocean along with Jenny and other people in the room and other people in um, environmental and ocean sciences. Sarah has been the chief scientist on 20 cruises maybe. We've been on a lot of cruises where we've taken the geological oceanography and biological oceanography classes out to sea on a Scripps Institution of Oceanography ship. And they learn to use oceanographic uh, equipment and they gather real world data that they come back to the lab and work on. So we, get, we gather water, we gather sediment samples, we get organisms, we take plankton, and uh, it all comes back and they get to experience both the science, the adventure, the expansion of horizons, and a lot of the things that have driven, uh, have really attracted all of us into this marine science. And I just wanted to um, stop with another sort of picture of the ocean because while we're doing our science and we might take our eyes off the ocean for a while, we always have to remember about how it fits in to the big picture. And so there's these wonderful horizons, but I like to think about that we have this small, in the vastness of an ocean like this, you've got this ship that's a small community of dedicated people working together in order to understand all of this enigma that is the ocean. So that's where I'll leave this one. All right, so yeah, I want to, this is great for uh, Natalie and Sue to come before me. I think it's gonna show you that there's not one way to get interested in studying the ocean. And so um, here's a picture of me on an oceanographic research vessel to prove that I've been on a boat. <laughs> and so most people I think, think of people who um, study the ocean, oh, they must have, uh, been at the beach a bunch of this kid. They might really like being out in the ocean. This is not the case for me. <laughs> not only do I get terribly seasick, I barely like being outside. <laughs> okay. um, I grew up in Pacific Beach, like there, and we went to the ocean I don't know, a couple times a year. And I was like, this is sandy. I got rescued by lifeguards a bunch of times. I was stuck in rip currents. Just not a good situation. So like how, like literally all my friends from when I was younger have, are flabbergasted that I'm an oceanographer. They, they cannot understand how this happened. So I represent for all the oceanographers or environmental scientists who just hang out inside for the most part, except for my teaching and we get to go outside with the students. So why am I interested in the ocean? Is the ocean is a really cool way that brings all the sciences together. Or, you know, what people might think of as some of the classic sciences like physics, biology, chemistry, geology, right? They all come together. So it's a really good thing for someone who doesn't like to make up their mind and has a short attention span. This is a great thing to study. But something that I will really touch upon that both um, Sue and Natalie touched upon is there is an important exposure aspect. Like how does someone even know that this is, exists as a place to study? So for me, that was important. So in high school, um, uh, there was something called National Ocean Sciences Bowl, which is a high school competition um, similar to like Jeopardy, but focused on uh, ocean trivia. And it actually started around the time I was in high school. And one of my teachers um, drafted me, encouraged me to be on this team. And you might think, oh, he must have encouraged me to be on this team because I was a really good student. No, because I was talking a lot and he thought this might be a good outlet for my energy, right? Like <laughs> I, I was very disturbing in class, maybe if I did this thing. So I did that, became, well, we did not win, we did very poorly, but it was, it was something that introduced me to the idea of the ocean and that it had all the sciences. Fast forward, I'm in college. I don't do stuff about the ocean, I, I'm a math major. And then finally, when I'm about to apply to graduate school, I was like, huh, there was that ocean thing that I did a little bit in high school. 
what if I looked back onto that? So it was really just kind of looking back to something that I was exposed to a long time ago. Um, and fun fact, now I run the National Ocean Science Bowl for the San Diego region. So now it's a fun way that I get to give back and um, run this thing. And the reason that that was started at the national level is because so few high school students have exposure to oceanography in their curriculum, right? That's very rare. And so that's something that the National Ocean Science Bowl is goal is to do. Okay, so I'm gonna give a specific example about how some of the sciences come together. Um, and in particular, how biology meets physics. And so you can see when Brian Clark introduced me, that's actually kind of in the, the title of my research interest is physical biological interactions. And this is really particularly interesting if you study something called plankton, which Natalie talked about, these small organisms. The type of plankton that Natalie uh, study, as she mentioned, are plankton that spend just part of their lives as plankton, and then they grow to become adults that are like adult crabs or other benthic uh, sea floor organisms. Whereas the, the type of plankton I study typically spend their whole life in the ocean, their whole life as plankton, okay? So there's this thing called life at low Reynolds numbers. It's actually the, the first lecture in my plankton ecology class next semester. And so what, what is this? So the low Reynolds number is a number that tells us something about the physics of the fluid environment that an organism lives in. And when I say fluid, I even mean air, it acts as a fluid in the, in the physics sense, okay? And so we, as relatively big things and whales, experience how we move through fluid in a certain way. So for example, when I walk through that door, I drag a little bit of air with me, but it's such an inconsequential amount of air that we never think about it. We don't think about, oh, uh, this is the air I'm dragging with me, right? This is not something we think about. And as with something our size, it's negligible. We can forget about it. For something that that's organism size, you cannot forget about it. Your whole life is dictated by the fluid that you drag around. And that's because if you're very, very small, you live in fluid in a way that's very, very viscous. So like honey, right? And so that means that our intuition of how organisms that size live is very bad. That's what makes this interesting for me. It's something that, because like when I was a kid, I was not outside playing, I was inside doing math puzzles. So for me, this is a math puzzle. How can something like this live in a world that's totally different? What is that like? All right, so I'm gonna give you some examples of what life is like at low Reynolds numbers. The first thing, this is a very old video, but a really famous one. And although I'm gonna show you a video, I actually have one of these devices that I use in real life in my classes. So it's more exciting in real life. So one of the bizarre things about low Reynolds number flow, i.e. how an organism that's really small moves in a fluid environment, is that flow is reversible. Again, completely non-intuitive for someone like us. So let's take a look, hopefully this video will work. What's in here is corn syrup. So by putting corn syrup in here, it mimics the environment where you're really small. He's putting a little bit of dye, okay? And then there's the, these are two concentric circles, so he's gonna spin one. Okay, this is G.I. Taylor, this is not me. He spins it and it mixes the, that dye in. That's intuitive, you're mixing it in, okay? So again, this is corn syrup, very viscous. It mimics what it's like if you're really small in the ocean. Then he's gonna do it backwards, okay? This should blow your mind. <laughs> This is not just me playing this video in reverse. This is him turning it the other direction. And it returns to the exact same spot because at low Reynolds number, flow is reversible. So what does that mean? Your high Reynolds number, you're a fish, like something that Sue studies. You swim like this. That works great, like a motorboat. This works great. You swim like this at low Reynolds number, you're not going anywhere. You're going forward and backwards, and forwards, and backwards. So how do you swim? You better have different non-reversible strokes. It affects everything about the form and the function, okay? Here's an example. This is a larval fish. So kind of like the type of larvae that Natalie studies, but this grows up to be an adult fish. Um, and so it's maybe a millimeter in size, give or take. 
So the interesting thing about larval fish is that as adults, they live at high Reynolds number. They live in an environment like we do, where they don't have to worry about reversible flow, dragging fluid around. So here is kind of a weird maladaption in their larval form. Okay, yum, food. Flow is reversible. That boundary layer, that dragging of fluid. This is in water, right? This is not in corn syrup, but because you're at such small scales, it acts like as if we were moving around in corn syrup. Completely non-intuitive. This is a picture of uh, a copepod, type of plankton, it feeds like this. And so these are its appendages. Look at the way the food moves around it. It looks like it's not water. It looks like it's moving in something thick, like honey. That's because it's such, such a small scale, fluid dynamics is different, not intuitive. So you can't, so if you, if you, if I told you, if I gave you a fork like this, and I had you feed with a fork, your intuition would be that it would act like a sieve, that you would collect things that were bigger than the fork. This is not the case because the fluid is so thick, even though it's not any thicker in real life, but it acts thicker relative to the organism, that it drags it like a paddle. Totally different. Um, okay, so to transition a little bit into my research, my research doesn't necessarily directly look at some of the, and so all those three pictures, uh, those three videos were from others. This is diving into my research a little bit. And so um, there's, I would say that the one um, running thread throughout my research is that, um, so I mentioned that an undergrad, it was a, a math major. And so when I come at studying biological things in the ocean, I think I come at it from a, a different angle because um, I didn't grow up looking in, in college, even in microscopes, things like that. And so what I do is I say, how can I use the way I think to study that type of things? And so now we have technology like cameras that allow us to track particle movements and observe particles in ways that we didn't before that technology existed. So for my PhD, that picture you saw of me on a boat, that was actually me deploying a very, very large high resolution camera to look at um, plankton distributions on really, really small scales. Because previous ways of doing that is dragging a net, which is excellent because then you can see what they are, but it destroys their small scale distributions, right? So since then, since I've been at USD and, and since even when I was a postdoc in North Carolina, I've really done switched to lab studies, but the common theme is that I use imaging. And I can use my background in computing and math to come up with algorithms to actually learn about what's going on in a way that's maybe answering very classic questions, but in a way that's maybe different than some people might approach it. So one of the things I've been focusing on recently is something called marine snow. So you really have to convince someone why anyone would study marine snow, because what is marine snow? Marine snow is you have phytoplankton that are single-celled um, photosynthetic organisms. They're like the plants of the ocean, but they're single-celled and they float. So they're super important. But marine snow is like these little plankton stick together. So they become little globs, just looks like globs of goo, and along with fecal pellets and sediment, and then they sink to the bottom of the ocean. So they're not even living organisms. They're made up of living organisms, but they themselves are just these sinking particles. So that seems kind of like pretty niche and boring to study. But when you realize that the deep ocean is the largest sink of carbon on our planet actively cycled, I got the geologist in the room, so I have to correct myself. The, the largest sink of actively cycled carbon on the planet, it turns out to be really important because we know that with the climate crisis, we have lots of CO2 that as humans we're putting into the atmosphere, and the ocean is a huge buffer for that, okay? But most of that, um, when that carbon gets absorbed by the surface ocean, it can freely go between the surface ocean and the atmosphere, except for that carbon that makes it deeper down. And one of the ways it makes it deep down is the sinking of particul particulate carbon, i.e. carbon in the forms of particles that then can sink and make it down to the deep ocean. So that's why it's interesting to study, even though it seems kind of weird. So these, this is, um, a video that I'm going to show you from my postdoc, where I was looking at the sinking of these particles and what happened when they crossed a sharp density gradient. So sharp density gradients occur in the ocean all the time because temperature and salinity change in the ocean. So when you have a sharp change in temperature salinity, you can get a density gradient. So here it goes. This is a video sped up about five times. Okay. 
The pink circle is just me tracking it for you. The yellow is just me drawing it. That's not real. And so you can see it sank and then it slowed down. Okay, interesting. But then if we wait a little bit more time, it starts speeding up again and then moves on its way. So this is a really interesting phenomenon that I call delayed settling. And what happens is this marine snow, um, unlike something like a rock, a rock has a density that's the same, no matter what kind of fluid you put it in. But marine snow particles are 99, over 99% water by volume. So they're like little sponges. So think of your sponge. When your sponge is filled with air, it's really light. You're, you're like kitchen sponge, right? But when it's filled with water, it's heavier. The same thing can happen with marine snow particles. You can have marine snow that's sinking, sinking, sinking. It hits the sharp density gradient and it's no longer heavy enough to keep sinking until it exchanges the fluid inside of it with the fluid in the water, bottom water. It increases its density and it can keep sinking. So you might think like, who cares? This particle, this is what I always say, I'm very contrarian even with myself. Who cares that this particle stopped for like 30 seconds on its way down to a thousand meters to the bottom of the ocean? Well, this is just one particle. In the ocean, there's many, many, many particles happening all at once. And what you can form is these layers of marine snow. So what um, Brian Clapp referred to as these patchy distributions of food, because of this marine snow particles, in addition to bringing carbon down to the deep ocean, acts as a food source for lots of organisms. So that's something that I've been um, studying more recently. This is work by, a former undergraduate student who then became one of our master students. And so here we have a layer of marine snow. So this was formed by making a density gradient, letting lots of marine snow sink, and it forms the sharp layer of marine snow. And then we had copepods. So that what that had on the first slide, like a plankton and SpongeBob, so copepod. So we can track. So we can use computer programs that we write. This is a live experiment, this is a real video. And we can track these copepods and then answer questions about their behavior. Do they spend more time in that layer? Do they turn a lot, right? And we can compare that to when that layer is present and when that layer is not present. And we can answer questions, even though this is in a laboratory setting, we can then extrapolate to the real ocean where these layers occur all the time. We see them in our field imaging. And then some of the most recent work is like, okay, I know copepods, like this little guy here, can now eat this marine snow. But how do I, they do it? This marine snow is bigger than they are. It's not clear how they're eating this marine snow. So let's zoom in and get a better look. Well, so here, this um, copepod is about two millimeters big, so about the size of a rice grain. You can imagine this copepod about the size of a rice grain. This whole video is maybe like two centimeters by two centimeters, where if you compare to this, this is like 40 centimeters. So this is a much bigger zoomed out than this. And the problem is when you're trying to um, film something that's so small, they're just going to swim away, right? Because I'm like, I'm really closely focused. If you do any camera work, you have a depth of field that's really, really narrow. And so something will just go in and out of focus. So I got to put them on a leash. This is a copepod leash. So what's this copepod leash? It's my human hair. So I do really weird stuff. I give my students hair that they then learn to glue to copepods and tether my copepods to keep them in the Field of view. I did not invent this technique. This is actually weirdly an accepted technique in this field. Is gluing <laughs> copepods to hair. <laughs> so here you go. Now this is filmed at two thousand frames per second. So you can see all of this copepod's appendages moving. You can see the sinking marine snow particle. So this is happening about sixty times slower than it happens in real life. This is a very very fast. This happens snap of a finger, but we slowed it down here so we can see how complex, as Natalie mentioned, the behavior of even these tiny organisms is. And then as it sinks, we see this copepod, even though it's on a leash, can interact with this marine snow. It swims through it, and we can see it form this plume. And the plume is really weird because it's viscous, it's low Reynolds numbers, right? So it's, it's acting really cool. And then by breaking up that marine snow, it's able to continue and feed through it. So that's what I do research on. Um, I want to echo something that both Sue and Natalie said that really actually the joy of my job, as, as much as I get into cocoa ponds and marine snow and doing weird things like this, is working with students. This is easily the best part of my job. Um, and something, you know, both with something like outreach like National Ocean Sciences Bowl 
or just every summer, I have a handful of undergraduate students from USD that we get to do stuff like this. So all the undergrads work on all these types of projects. Uh, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Very much. That was really, really fascinating. Um, we have the, the 10 or 15 minutes for thoughts, queries, reflections, questions, so on and so forth. Could you maybe turn on your microphone instead? Should we pick people? <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yeah, my question is actually for you. Uh -huh. um, so is the density gradient continuous? And if it is, then why does uh, why does the layer form at a specific location? Yeah, good question. It's not continuous, it's a sharp change in density. Um, and so I the way I form it in the lab is I form it with salinity in the lab, but in the field it can be either because of temperature or salinity. So I take saltier water and I pour it in half my tank. And then I take like a sponge that's sitting in some styrofoam. And I really slowly pump um, less salty water on top of it. And that gets so actually, um, because uh, when the density of water changes, it changes the refractive index. And so if you kind of like go like this in my tank, even though water is clear, you can see it. So yeah, it's sharp. Okay. I have, though, there has been some people who've played with more linear density gradients like that, though. And that, that does slightly different things, okay. but it doesn't result in that sharp layer like you were talking about. Thanks so much, all three of you. I really, really Really enjoyed it. And the questions for all three of you, I'm just curious about next steps. Like, so, what's next? More? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Um, next steps in terms of research or, oh, well, so um, I still, so I still do larval research. Yeah. Um, we have multiple undergraduates and graduate students that work in my lab, and we are looking at plankton distributions in the water column, trying to understand how it really is that they get to shore. And most of what we do now is really, really close to shore. It's sort of the mystery area because physically for an oceanographer, it's really hard to measure what's happening in the near shore. And you can think of it if you go out surfing, it's where all the waves are breaking. And so it's really hard to do that work, <laughs> but that's what we're trying to figure out is how do the larvae get through all that and get back to shore? So. <laughs> Obviously, I've been chair for a couple of years. <laughs> yeah, you have two people who've been chair. Yeah, yeah, and um, my yeah, uh, research partners <laughs> at Southwest Fisheries, they were actually forbidden to be in the building uh, for a long period of time. And so we have not, uh, we're just starting to sort of figure out what that next step is going to be because um, uh, we, we couldn't run the experiments. <laughs> Yeah, for me, the, 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 the project with, with copepods with zooplankton I'm gonna show you is, is recent work that I started since I've been at USD. I didn't work with zooplankton at all until I came to USD. Um, so that's an ongoing project. Uh, one thing I'll say that um, is really fun about working at a place like USD is doing undergraduate research, working with undergraduates who are doing research is I feel it pushes you to be a little bit more innovative and, and push yourself out of your box than you other would, otherwise would. Um, I don't know if I can say this, oh, I can because I have tenure is that I don't have to worry about every single project I do ending in publication. And so it lets me be riskier than I would at a school where I feel like I have to publish, you know, just nonstop, right? So I, I do publish my work, but it means that I can let a student try something that I have no idea if it'll work. So I had a student this summer who was working on um, seeing how plastic gets rolled into marine snow. I don't know anything about that. Uh, it did weird things. We are still learning. Uh, I had another student who was looking at ocean acidification and how that affected marine snow. I don't know anything about that. I know almost no chemistry. So that was kind of fun. Yeah. All right. Uh, this question is uh, directed to you, Jessica. Not because you're my niece. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. But uh, because you presented a project that was, that I want to say, that really hooked up the scientists. I want to say that particularly. And not too long ago, in fact, maybe a couple of weeks ago, I was in Los Angeles. It was particularly Mark Heidegger criticizing Nyakon. Okay. 
<laughs> Am I going to be able to answer this question? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So uh, when that was presented to me, I was reading through it. Immediately, my mind popped to the boson, the Higgs boson. Mm -hmm. And I thought the experiment was interesting because, of course, I didn't understand what the particle was. But the reason why they could even identify the Higgs boson is because they always have to contact with the Higgs field. Without the Higgs field, first of all, you might not even discover it. But even if you discover it, you wouldn't know what the heck it is. Because you have to have a context in order to understand the understanding of what the thing is. Okay? Which means that there really is a relation of the mind trying to understand a context that constructs the dimension of what is possible for the understanding to understand the thing. So I think what you presented in terms of presenting this sort of fluid dynamics, our intuition is completely in a different context. And so therefore we would not understand like, oh, what is this? We don't understand it. The fact that you have exposed this, now we have a context to understand the creatures within that structure. And that's what understanding comes from. So I just want to point out that in fact, philosophy, I've talked about that thing you just talked about. All right. So <laughs> I will address this question that was really a comment. Um, <laughs> but no, I think it's a really good point. I think the way I'll, I'll bring it back is that something that probably all of us learned early on in science is that science is very incremental, right? It builds on this former body of knowledge, in, which is what gives you that context, which is what asks you, helps you ask good questions in the first place. And for, and for, Often, early scientists, some of our undergrads, they want to come in and uh, save the world, which is really an excellent thing. But then you learn like how incremental and, and niche everything feels. But it's because you're adding to that body of knowledge. And actually, good science helps you ask more questions. So that's kind of an answer to that. Yeah. So this is I'm arrogant. I've worked with all three of you for a long time. <laughs> but what I find interesting with Natalie's presentation and Sue are more because you've been doing it so longer. You tag things when you were 16, you tag things when you were not 16, so the field is you would see the same thing for you. So my question is, how do you maintain this energy, this interest, this allure of the ocean, now that you've been doing it for 10, 20, 30 years, 40, depending on some of you for 30 years? So how, how do you keep that energy of wanting to continue? Or because you tag things five years ago when I would ask you. So why do you do it now that you get to it Jenny Bond? How do you keep this going? How do I keep it going? Well, the night work, I think I'm getting too old for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how much longer I can keep that going. Um, I think it's just, you never know what you're gonna find. And so I think there's that, it's still that, that discovery and that, yeah, I've been doing this or maybe I'm just stupid and I keep doing the same thing over and over again. Um, I, this is the same issue I face, so I, since 2014, I've been keeping a time series of barnacle settlement in La Jolla. And so it's a time series now, which means that sometimes I've gone out every day, but now I go out once a week and I collect this data. And um, I don't know how many times, um, in particular, my father-in-law used to say this to me all the time. He's like, what are you going to do with this data? I'm like, it's a time series. I can't stop. <laughs> I don't want to break the time series. It's going to be really important one day. This is going to answer so many questions. So on the, it's just, I think that knowledge of, um, I don't know, it's a Part of it is just the excitement, the not knowing what's coming. Um, part of it is the projects change, the students that are involved change, the questions change a little bit. Yeah, maybe we're using the same methods, but it's still exciting. So hopefully it'll stay that way. Well, I, for me, I, I guess maybe I'm a little bit, I can't make up my mind. It's like, I like <laughs> to learn about a lot of things. 
And so the one of the primary reasons why I chose to come to USD because it was the a liberal arts um, university. And so I came here and I, I every semester I'm teaching everything from oceanography or something on the large scale, or at least I have to be reading about it so that I know what's happening. And then trying to keep up with things that are happening on the molecular scale, and um, which is maybe a little bit closer to some of the work that I've done. And so bridging everything in between then that is uh, really exciting. And then it keeps me on my toes because it's just a lot of different stuff. <laughs> and I think that that's what I really enjoy. Um, I think if I were doing something that were going too narrow, and sort of doing it over and over again, that it wouldn't have that same kind of appeal. But the, the ability to do something different and to change every once in a while. And, and the, the students certainly come in and will push you in a different direction now and again with projects. And then that's, uh, you never know if that's going to be your next big thing or whether it's just an interesting little sideline. So keep showing your toes. Yeah. With, with the ocean water warming due to climate change. What impact is that having on the marine life? So many. <laughs> uh, that I mean, for our, for larvae, I'll I'll speak for larvae, and then because there are so many different impacts. Um, we're just starting to understand because warming temperature means, in some cases, higher metabolic rates for larvae, which might mean they need to feed more, but there might be less food because the structure of the ocean changes in terms of how layered it is because the layering in many places or at least certainly in southern california happens with changes in temperature so if you, you've got sun at the surface that warms the surface of the water as you get deeper it's colder and that layering creates these density gradients and that those density gradients prevent things from moving vertically including larvae and so there are many ramifications and so we're some of the stuff that we're doing is actually looking at barnacles which live in the rocky intertidal habitats and we're trying to understand what their thermal tolerance is so these are organisms that live in areas that get really really hot because if it's low tide and it's sunny it gets hot in those areas but we don't have a good understanding of how hot how much heat can they tolerate and what does that do to their reproduction, reproductive output, larval production, and, and then how does that later relate to how those populations survive and persist? So that's one example of things. And you can <laughs> echo that with um, larger organisms as well, that they face many of the same problems with um, changes in diet, changes in accessibility of food. Uh, they also uh, reproduce with larvae. So anything that's happening to the, in the small world is also affecting them. And then there's a lot of changes in range extensions and things. So a lot of organisms move with the temperature. And so they find themselves perhaps in competition with different organisms, or there's obviously changes that happen on the human side, because if people have been depending on particular populations of marine organisms as food sources, they may be moving somewhere else or changing in number. Yeah, no, I mean, there's it, there's so many effects, and I think that's why um, I, I think it's sometimes, it, it, and this is also shows how important science communication is, because sometimes, it, you know, it's easy to, to have your head so deep into the specific project you're working on that you forget that this is such an important issue that we have to communicate to policymakers, to 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 kids, to teachers, to everyone, right, because it's, it's affecting all of us. And so um, it's sometimes I think it's hard for um, people to understand, because we do a bad job of communicating it, um, why it's not just easy to predict what happened. It's getting hotter. Isn't it just going to scale linearly? And the answer is no, because there's so many competing trade-offs in terms of how things are happening. So for example, as um, Natalie mentioned, the, the surface ocean is getting warmer. That might favor certain species. But then because these density gradients are, are getting, that I was referring to are getting sharper, because the, the surface ocean is getting warmer faster than the deep ocean. Uh, and so because of that, you have nutrients that don't come up from the deep ocean, the nutrients come up from the deep ocean, and then that uh, hinders many types of species. On the other hand, um, so there's, there's been some of the, in the last like decade, there's been the first expeditions 
um, to study phytoplankton in the Arctic because it was all ice covered until now, right? And so on one hand, oh, great, we can go see it now, but that's because there's not ice. And so we're for the first time like learning what is happening to the, the phytoplankton composition and among other larger organisms in places that literally were not exposed until now. So there's all sorts of these competing trade-offs that I think is true in lots of disciplines that makes uh, the effect, the ramifications that's really hard to understand. Uh, but we're all kind of doing little bits of that. Yeah, Chris? So I have an adjacent question. Uh -huh. um, given that our corporations are basically killing us, and <laughs> they're making sure that you don't have an ocean to even study, how do we use our personal advocacy to ensure that you get continue to work? Let's tackle that tough one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is why some uh, uh, a, um, a center like this that's, that's focusing on interdisciplinary stuff is so important. Science doing, you know, science in a vacuum is like, if no one hears about it, is useless, right? As, just as if, you know, philosophy, I would argue doing in a vacuum is also useless. And those connections between it, right, is what's really moving us forward in terms of our holistic understanding of these really complex issues, right? And so it has to do with, yeah, political science, right? It has to do with psychology and communication. It certainly has to do with economics and capitalism and, and, and so many things. And um, really importantly, uh, the focus now on environmental justice, right? It's, it's like, this is not just some like uh, issue that kind of just like, oh, you know, I think particularly in the past, you would just see pictures of polar bears, right? Like, okay, this is what sums up this issue. And we're really now trying to understand this working across uh, disciplines. So this is like not a good answer just to say that it's really, really hard. <laughs> but I don't know if you want to. I think because there is more focus now on um, environmental justice and on how the um, climate change is actually causing changes that have immediate human effects. You, you hear it talked a lot more, I think, in the in the media, and I think people are coming to understand that um, if I don't care about polar bears. I probably do care about um, you know my town that's going to be flooded uh, in, as sea level rises or because there's a swell that's in advance of the hurricane that's hitting Florida right now. So that that brings it around to people and um, getting people mobilized to do something is definitely more of a challenge. But um, I think educating people and having them actually um, agree. Uh, to the facts that have been documented by so many oceanographers for so long is, is certainly a first step. One last comment or question? Yeah. Um, my favorite part about your talk was the uh, human hair bit, where you're like, yeah, it's like human, like, yeah, I, we just tied them up with human hair. And I know that like science has told us all sorts of like, we're not funded enough, so we have to like, <laughs> be creative in our methodology in ways that are very interesting to outside uh, people. And I was wondering if you guys had any sort of oh, thank you. human hair <laughs> or like little shortcuts or just some stories of like oh. interesting parts of methodology that would be in, like interesting to Well, as oceanographers, <laughs> um, duct tape. <laughs> yeah. Best friend. yeah duct tape and twist and um the, cable ties yeah cable okay. ties are your friends and they're used in so many uh creative ways um on the cruise that i showed pictures from antarctica we had this expensive high definition uh <laughs> camera remote vehicle that had all kinds of bells and whistles it had pumps to pump plankton it had all kinds of things and it could go down underneath the icebergs and things but it was on a tether and um, I believe the second time that it was deployed, the uh, tether got cut and it, it was supposed to be neutrally buoyant, but in the temperature of the Antarctic, it was not, so it sank. And the engineers built a replacement out of just stuff that was on the ship. And then they continued the cruise because, you know, we were in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I don't know that I can think of a good example. It's just so many things go wrong, especially when you're in the field. And it's always about, okay, what do we have to just piece it together and zip ties, duct tape, pieces of line. Those are always the things that, that come in handy. Um, yeah, the marking stuff we've used, nail polish. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that works really well on snails actually. Nice.
<laughs> not like the pencils. Um, yeah, it's just, I always tell my students when we're doing marine ecology that it's all about just being really creative. Um, I think one of my favorite examples of a published paper is actually something that um, Paul Dayton, a famous marine ecology uh, person, marine ecologist wrote. He was interested in looking at how um, big logs, he was in the Pacific Northwest, would hit the rocky intertidal and might knock off barnacles. And he couldn't think of a good way to do it without being there and watching. So he actually stuck two by fours out and he nailed nails into the two by fours, but he didn't nail them in all the way. So they stuck out a bit and attached them to the rocks and then counted how many nails had been banged off or banged in um, as a proxy for understanding how logs might come in and disrupt things. So it's just about being really creative. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a really good point because I used to think when I was younger that as someone who was into the math and sciences that I wasn't creative. And I've, the more I've, I've gotten older, I realized that is the complete opposite, that it takes all sorts of creativity to, to, to probably, it's, it's a different maybe form of creativity, but it, it absolutely is, is you know, I, I harness my creativity all the time. So yeah, it's a really good point. Well, we, we can see you respect that analysis now. <laughs> I just want to say thank you. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. <laughs> uh, so, so so, uh, thank you so very much. And please, uh, actually, do come and join us next week when we continue these sessions on the allure of the ocean and its specific art and literature and other things. There'll be lots of talk about uh, what kind of effect it's on the sea, of course, from Africa. But until then, I mean, see you all, and particularly lovely to see you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.